Welcome back to the Ace Talks podcast, where we talk about Ecuador and a little more. And today, we're going to have a part two of the Healthcare in Ecuador podcast episode that we had. And in this episode, my main focus is going to be on my most current or most recent healthcare experience, my most recent experience going to the hospital. And I am also going to look at some of the healthcare experiences I've had in the past, as well as talking about answering some of the questions that I saw on my previous podcast episode. So let's begin with, I guess, the obvious truth. And it's the fact that I am technically no longer injured. You probably won't be able to tell uh, because if you're listening to this in audio version, then you can't see it. But I am currently in my recording studio, I guess you could call it. It's not really my recording studio. I just take advantage and come and record at the library over at the museum. And it happens to be a very nice space with a lot of books around, let's just say. And since I'm here and without crutches, and without a cast, I guess you can clearly say that my injury is, for the most part, gone. I can walk, everything's pretty normal. But there were some, I guess you could say, warnings that I have to adhere to until I can completely say that I am injured. I am not injured. So that's why I'm technically not injured, but kind of still am. We'll talk about that in a bit uh, at the end of my story, because now, Uh, I would like to tell you about my whole experience with going to the hospital this time around and make some comparisons, I guess, to the last time I went, which was when I actually got injured. So we'll, we'll make the comparisons after, but for now, let's listen to the story. So the day that I went to the, to the hospital, this is the hospital de especialidades, which is, I guess you could call it a specialty hospital, because that was the place where I got attended first. When I went there, I went accompanied by a friend, which I would like to take the time to appreciate and tell him, uh, my friend Andres, um, thank you very much for accompanying me, because honestly, I had no idea how I was going to get there. I was already suffering, trying to ask my brother to take me on the motorcycle, and that wasn't the ideal situation. But I had my friend who agreed to, to help me out with this because he's always told me, if you need help, I will help you out. Uh, and he's just a good friend. He's a great friend. So I really appreciate it. So my friend took me to, to the hospital. And we went there at around, let me see, I have the time. I have it in a photo, around 4 o'clock. So we went around 4 p.m. We went, if I remember correctly, on a Saturday, and based on the date, because we went on the 26th of August, it's been about a month since I actually went and got my, my whole, you know, post-examination. And we went at that hour. So we went, and the first thing that happened, very different, obviously, from when I got wheeled in from the ambulance, was the fact that I was attended by the lady who pretty much gets your like initial diagnosis, uh, takes your blood pressure, asks you what the problem is, and pretty much gives you an idea of how long you'll be waiting. They even gave me this strip, which I left at home, but I have the picture here. And the strip is blue, and that's very important because there's something I want to talk about uh, in regards to that a little bit later on. But the strip is blue, but when they tied it on my hand, on my wrist, because it was something that goes on your wrist, uh, it was uh, it was reverse tied. And instead of blue, that other side is white, and it said verde, which is green. So what I noticed with that, and I guess I should explain it now, so that way you understand, because that might be very confusing, is that this is the whole uh, triage or triage, triage. Um, the classification of emergencies that we talked about in the previous video, the previous podcast episode. And it's funny because they do technically have it, but they don't 100% seem to always adhere to it, as I mentioned with what happened with what the doctor said in the previous video, but we'll leave the comparisons for later. But basically, the levels that we see here, 
they start from obviously the most severe, which is uh, red. And this is when you need, uh, you need to be revived, I guess. So this is literally you immediately get attended. Uh, level two is just an emergency and the wait time typically is around 10 to 15 minutes. I would assume that last time when I went, that was probably the treatment that I got. Because like I said, I pretty much got in, got asked like a few questions by one of the doctors or nurses who was there and they just wheeled me straight into the room. But I do think there's a reason for that as well. Um, but we'll talk about that in a bit. And yellow is urgent. Um, so that one, it says 60 minutes. Then we have the green, which is level four. And this was a uh, minor urgency. And then there's level five, which is no urgency. And the green one was two hours and blue was four hours. So I got classified as a level green, of course, because like I said, uh, that was what it said on the strip, even though the opposite side was blue. Um, but the visible side that they gave me was, it said green. So I sat down and waited with everyone else and waited with my friend, which thankfully my friend was there at least at the beginning um, because we sat there, we had a conversation. So we waited for about an hour and it didn't really feel like an hour, it felt like less because we just talked so much about so many different things. And we saw how people came in, we saw how some people came in later and got attended faster. And not necessarily because they looked like they had more severe injuries or anything, it just, I'm not sure why that happened. But there was that. And then after an hour, my friend, he decided to call his father-in-law, here you call them Suegro, he's not married, but he has his girlfriend and his girlfriend's dad actually works at the hospital, at that same hospital. It's like the most amazing coincidence, um, but it, it had a benefit and at the same time not because he called him and his father-in-law said, hey, I'll go, I'll check it out. And he came down, like he came after like, let's just say 10 minutes after the call and he talked to both of us. He said that with what I had, since it was check, it was technically just me needing to get it checked. And he thought that it was just to have the cast removed, which he said I could have done myself. But the thing is, I remember, because this is what I remember what the doctors had told me the first time I was there, I had to go and get like a post diagnosis. Like, oh, hey, check it out. See if you need to use the cast. Maybe who knows another month. Um, get some x-rays to make sure everything is fine. So that's the reason why I went. Because if not, I, I myself was already thinking during the days that led up to me going, like, hey, I might as well just remove this myself because it could be removed myself. But um, I wasn't sure because I still obviously didn't know how good my ankle was and how fixed the fracture that I had was. Because remember, I did have a fracture, which I probably should have mentioned uh, at the beginning of this episode, but the two injuries that I had were basically the dislocation um, and the fact that there was a, a tiny hairline fracture, at least that's the way I would interpret it. And the good thing was that the fracture wasn't on the major bone. Um, it was on the, I don't remember what the bones are called. I'm not a doctor, so please, I'm apologi I apologize for not being able to explain that. But the way that the doctors explained it was that if it would have been on the main bone, then I would have definitely needed surgery. It would have been a much more complex process. Um, but since it wasn't a serious injury, it was just a hairline fracture, they were like, no, you can just use a cast and after the two months, you should be fine. So that's what the route we went for and that's what happened. So. Going back to the situation with my friend's uh, father-in-law, uh, he thought that since, you know, it was just removing the cast, I could just, you know, remove it myself. Or he was just like, hey, you know, we can just remove that really quickly. And I was like, no, 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 we need, uh, I need to get the x-ray, you know, I need to get it checked out because that's what they told me to do. Uh, and they even said it themselves. We'll have it ready for, that, for you for like when a month, the, no, the two months pass, you can come and we will, you know, do this whole process so that you can make sure everything is fine. 
So he's like, oh, okay. So he just like basically said, ah, well, you just have to wait then. And then, you know, he just talked for a bit and then he left. And my friend also, ironically that day, he had to go, he had to leave. He did obviously come back later, which I'll mention in a bit, but he had to leave because an emergency popped up for him. He's a very busy guy. That's why I really appreciated him being there. But he had an emergency come up, so he had to leave. And the emergency, just to sum it up, was basically he got a call that uh, one of his family members, his brother, they couldn't find him and around the area where he was at. It's not that they couldn't find him. It was more like they couldn't get in touch with him. And recently, close to that area, like two or three blocks away, his brother wasn't involved in it, but two or three blocks away, there was a shooting. And it was like, you know, his family freaked out. So they sent their dad and their dad didn't come back. So that's why they called my friend and he had to go see if his dad and his brother were okay. Um, good thing everything, everyone was fine, but um, he had to go do that. So he told me to just, you know, hit him up after the, you know, after I got attended. Because like, it's, like I said, I was in category four, minor urgency, green, which was two hours. And we had already waited for like an hour and almost 30 minutes. So he left, he went to go pick up his family members. And then afterwards he went to go, I guess, take a break at home and do some other things actually, because I'm pretty sure he had more things to do if I remember correctly. And the thing about that was after that, I was just by myself. So I was just, you know, waiting. I was literally patiently waiting with my hands crossed, you know, watching as people came in, as people left. I also saw another situation. This is why like, you know, it, it really, there is a factor where I feel like if you know someone, things happen because there was a guy who showed up with his girlfriend, I assume. If not, that was his mom, I don't know. But they showed up and I saw when they entered, because you could see the entrance, they started talking to like one of the doctors or nurses and you know, they looked really friendly. And then afterwards, when they came to sit down like in the waiting area, not long after that same friend brought him a wheelchair and not long after that, they actually took him to go get checked. And I mean, I don't think he had his, like I'm not saying my injury was more severe, but I know there were people around who had more severe injuries and it looked like he got attended before they did. So I thought that was pretty unfair, especially considering that a lot of us were just, you know, patiently waiting. But that wasn't the only thing that happened during the time that I was waiting there. So. During the time that I was waiting, I also noticed that um, there were people who were just kind of like standing next to the doctor's door. And I thought it was just, you know, because there was the charger and one of the people was actually charging their phone. But then after a while, I saw that one of the people who was waiting next to the door just kind of like looked into the doctor's office. And I guess they talked and that made it so that the person they were with got attended faster. At least that's what it looked like. I can't say that's the truth. It just, that's what it looked like. Especially considering like there was a screen where I noticed that my name and my number and, the, and everything was like, it was always close to being my turn, but it was never my turn. <laughs> so wh why do I say that? Why do I say never? Because I waited a long time and I actually have the pictures here because by the time I finally got in like with the doctor and everything, like remember I showed up at like four, like maximum 4.30. And by the time I actually got like attended, it was around 7.46, probably around eight by the time I was actually done with everything because the last photo I took at home was at 9.39 p.m. And that was when I actually had like the, the little slip and everything. And of course, I mean, after we finished uh, with the appointment, we went out to eat something really quick because I wanted to thank my friend so I invited some to something to eat, him and his girlfriend, because his girlfriend was there too. So we went to grab a bite to eat, and then afterwards we went back home. And by that time it was late. But remember, once again, I got there at 4, maximum 4.30, and I got out at 8, which means there were four hours for me to just, literally the process was so fast. And I should probably go into that. I literally got into the doctor's office. I had to wait a little while because one of the other doctors came in and started telling him blah, blah, blah. Like they were literally about to just like tell me, you know, wait a little bit longer because they were saying like, you know, there's someone else who needs to be attended uh, really quick. But um, they asked me what I had. I told them that this was the situation. They told me to come back. 
so I can get my x-rays and I could get this cast removed. And then they were just like, okay, okay. And I got attended. He got someone to carry me over to the, not carry me, you know, wheel me over to the x-ray site. Once again, the whole being wheeled experience is a lot nicer than, than I thought it would be. Maybe it's just me being very comfortable, but it was a very, very comfortable, you know, getting wheeled over to the x-ray station. And um, I went to the x-ray station. I got my x-rays. This time they were much faster than last time. I'm guessing because now post-injury, probably a little bit easier. Then afterwards, I got wheeled back to, not, to like another little waiting station. And I got attended really quickly after that. And the doctor told me, would remove my cast and told me everything is, everything's good now. Your injury is good. The only thing, and this is what I was saying earlier, the only thing that makes it so that my injury isn't completely healed is the fact that since it was a fracture, you imagine in your mind, if you're listening to this, imagine a tube, a literal just tube, which would be my bone. Or imagine a bone if you want. And imagine it being kind of like with a crack, right? The crack has been healed, but there's still kind of like a line that shows that it hasn't been connected completely. Like it's been healed. Like the, it's literally the two bones are back in place. Like there's no crack anymore. It's just kind of a line showing where the crack used to be. Because of that line, I can't do extreme physical activity with my legs, at least from what the doctor said, at least for about two to three months, months. And right now it's only been a month since I got my cast removed. So I still got about one month to two months to go. And it's reasonable to say that that amount of time is correct because even now I still have certain pains in my ankle and I don't think they're related exactly to the bone, but I can't confirm if they're, they are or aren't because there's also a part of my calf, I guess on the left side, the outside part, which I'm guessing that's where the bone was where I still feel a little bit of pain in some moments, like not doing nothing. If I'm just laying down, I don't feel anything. But if I maybe take a step, um, if I'm standing for a prolonged period of time, uh, in random situations, I'll feel this kind of pain. But it's clearly much better than it was before because it's no longer injured. And this is probably just part of the process while it's still mending the whole little line that still exists. So I am, of course, walking now. I am, of course, I have been little by little walking more, but I'm still not risking extreme exercise. For example, I haven't jumped at all. I haven't run at all. <laughs> the other day, I almost did a quick take, like, oh, like a quick movement, like a juke. And I was like, oh, no, don't do that. <laughs> but nothing like going to the extreme because I do want to heal correctly before I'm able to like, you know, say, hey, I'm going to go out and run. Hey, I'm going to go out and jump and do crazy things. I do obviously take advantage and come and like today I came here to record. I go to work on my own motorcycle now. So that way I don't have to ask the person who was picking me up and dropping me off, which I would also like to appreciate uh, Mr. George, who's the person who was helping me out during this time. Really appreciate that. It was um a fun experience because once again being taken is much different than you driving it's very stressful driving on the streets here but we'll leave that for another time so basically the doctor she told me you are fine just you know take it easy and that at least until now that's what I've been doing and like I said once I got you know checked and once the, talk, the doctor gave me the okay I called my friend and I told him, hey, I'm ready. He's like, okay, I'm waiting for you outside. I went and it was over. So that was my experience, my second experience with the healthcare system. And the exit was much faster than the first. Now let's, let's go into the comparisons. So the, the process this time, the initial process was much worse, I'd say especially considering the fact that according to the, like, it, like I said, I had green level four and I was only supposed to take around two hours, which is still a long time, but at least it was you know, only two hours. And it took them almost four hours for me to get attended. And like I said, I'm not gonna say that there aren't people with you know, more urgent situations, but, and you can't, I guess you can't really gauge them just by what you see. 
But at least from what I could see, a lot of people who didn't have as severe of a situation as mine, you know, got attended before I did. And I could understand if we were all, you know, well, if they were all level orange, which is level two, but the majority of them seemed to be in a similar situation as mine, where they were level green. And some, I could have probably even taken and said they were level blue, which, you know, at that point, they had to get attended after me. But there were cases where I also thought it was unfair for some people who got attended after other people who weren't, you know, in as much of a severe situation. Like I said, the guy who came in had the help from, I don't know, their family or friend. He literally got attended as soon as the guy came out with a wheelchair. They took him away and it was just like, okay, there's this guy who's sitting like next to me, not next to me, but like in some chairs like close by. And he, I literally couldn't understand what he was saying. And he had, I guess, his daughter who was accompanying him. And like when I heard them talk, like it was hard to understand the dad. Like, I don't know if he had some kind of speech impediment, but it was difficult to understand him. So I was like, I felt like he should get it, like, you know, attended first, especially since he literally got there with a wheelchair and he like was shirtless. Like, I don't know, it was a, it was a weird thing, but I felt like he definitely deserved to be attended first. The good thing was a, a lady who sat down next to me, we had a little conversation and she actually got attended her. She was with her mom and they actually got attended pretty quickly. Um, and her mom had like this hand injury. So I was happy that they got attended before me. I didn't mind that because it looked like they needed it more. But, you know, this is where I, I wanna compare the whole situation of having help. Because as you noticed, my friend literally called his father-in-law and I got attended at least in a minor sense by his father-in-law, just, you know, kind of telling me about the situation. Like, hey, if it's not a big deal, you know. And I'm guessing, I, 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 don't, I didn't hear a hint of frustration, but I'm guessing in his mind, he might have thought like, what are you doing here if you've just got to get a cash removed? But the reality is that I needed to get the cash removed and the x-rays and the post-examination because that was the whole process that they told me I needed. If not, if I would have just told, if they would have just told me, hey, two months, you don't even need to come back. Just get the cash removed. I wouldn't have gone back. Why would I, why would I spend four hours of my life waiting for nothing? It, it would make no sense. So I went because it was the appropriate and legal thing that they asked me to do. But anyways, as I was saying, uh, it just felt kind of crazy that they have a system that they weren't really enforcing. Like I said, it took me more than two hours. And you can say that that's like a minimum, although it doesn't say it from what I can read in the image. You could say that that was a minimum. But even if we talked about, okay, let's just say, fashionably late, another 30 minutes, or an hour at least. I was there almost four hours, if not four hours, waiting to get attended and seeing how people who literally got attended before me, like didn't have the same urgencies. And I was like, what? I don't know, it was, <laughs> I, I thought it was kind of dumb um, and frustrating more than anything. But like I said, I can't speak for what level of urgency they had because even the strip that they gave us, like I said, mine said green, but only because I could see the text on it. And the other side was blue. And maybe some people had urgency yellow and I just couldn't see it. Who knows? But that's another thing that I kind of wanted to talk about because it, it feels like just in that level, and that's a very like entry level situation, but it feels like just in that level, there's a lack of supplies because maybe they're doing it with like li literal written text because they don't have any more yellow strips or orange strips or green strips or red strips and they only have blue because maybe they have those in abundance. But I was like, if that was the system, like by colored strip, why don't you have all the other colored strips? So that way people don't have to assume that we're just being effed over. Literally, like it, it just feels bad. It's a bad feeling. So, and it's not like they have to report like, oh, this person has a more grave injury than you, a more severe one. But you know, it just, it makes you give more peace of mind and not feel like you're being screwed over. <laughs> um, although you could also look at the screens, but like I said, I think the only time I saw the screen with a person of a, of a more urgent situation than mine 
was the lady that sat down next to me. And she had, I think, yellow or orange. But I know hers was more urgent. That's why I didn't mind her going before me. But anyways, that was uh, just a very frustrating situation overall. Um, and then, once again, I'd like to compare the fact, once again, going into having contacts, uh, a person who can help you. Because last time, remember, when I got there, of course, my situation was much more urgent at that time. I came in in a literal ambulance. But last time, I also did have a lot of help from my friend who worked at that hospital. Like, he was literally talking to everyone and making sure things flowed quickly. But this time, because he, he told me that he had already spoken and he had told them that, you know, he had tried to get me a turn, supposedly, which I'm not sure, like, I'm not going to doubt his, his, you know, desire to help because he helped me out a lot in the first round. But maybe it's like, like that kind of situation. And I'm not saying this is the case, but where you're like, I already asked for help one time, so I don't think I can do that again. And when he, and maybe he tried to, but he got like shut down because no, we already helped you out once. We can't keep helping you out. Maybe it was like that. Maybe he just didn't want to try um, this time because he knew the severity wasn't the same as the first time. I'm not gonna speculate too much on that. I'll let you, you know, grab your own conclusions based on what I said, but I just found it weird how the first time, you know, he was able to get so much help. Once again, maybe it was because of my injury. It was more severe that time. But in the second time, I feel like we had two months to prepare to ask for, a, you know, to schedule an appointment. And I don't know if he just did it like last minute and it just too late. And it's not even his job to do that, to be honest. Like, that's what I had to do. But I was kind of hopeful since he worked there, you know, he would, he would help me out a little bit. But once again, that would be my fault for expecting that. What, well, what would have been ideal would be me going there and scheduling my own appointment. But, you know, I wasn't leaving the house for anything other than work. So I kind of felt like I, I put myself in a, in a precarious situation, I guess, because I could have gone. It would have, you know, been uncomfortable, but I could have gone and tried to schedule and see when exactly I could go. But I don't even know if you can schedule appointments there in the way that I would want them to be scheduled because I didn't try. So for the most part, I'll blame it on myself. I'll accept that blame because it's not fair for me to blame my friend who helped me the first time and, you know, just maybe couldn't do it again the second time. We'll take it as, a, as an L from my part. But it did feel very different. The whole process felt different, especially considering how fast I got attended the first time and how slow I got attended the second time. And it's, it's not like there were a lot of people that day. Uh, it, the, the room could have been full, but there were literally like gaps in seats. Um, sometimes it was just one person laying down and just sleeping because it was a kid. Um, and sometimes just someone who I'm guessing might have been there for a while and just, just taking a nap. But it was never like, like full. So I felt like it just took an insane amount of time for what I needed to, to get, especially considering how fast I got out, which in comparison to the first time, it took me a long time to get out the first time, which was weird because, like I said, the first time when I went there, I actually, when I was done with everything, I got my x-ray, I just, we just sat there waiting. And they finally, like, took me out after, like, almost an hour, maybe. And on the other hand, over here, like, literally once the doctor, she took off my cast and everything, she was just like, yeah, you can go. I was like, okay, <laughs> I'm not complaining. And I left. But seriously, an hour versus literal seconds just felt like a crazy difference. I don't know. Might have been just because of the severity. Might have been just because she just happened to be free. But um, it was a weird thing. So that's my story about uh, what happened with uh, this round, my, med my healthcare situation, and as well as some comparisons. Like I said, first time was really fast at the beginning, really slow at the end. Second time was extraordinarily slow at the beginning, but super fast at the end. The second time I didn't have as much help, the first time I did, but the first time I had a more severe injury, and the second time was just basically ensuring that that injury was done. So now let's 
let's go into some of the questions that I saw in the comments of the first, the first healthcare episode. And the first question was, do you have ES, which is the private insurance here, or private health insurance? Um, I have heard from expats that taking an ambulance may be too slow if you are dying. Uh, they recommend taking a taxi to the hospital. What do you think? So going into the first, do I have ES? I don't. That was another complication that occurred at the end of my appointment with the, with the doctor because when the doctor talked to me, she asked me if I had uh, insurance, ES. But unfortunately, I don't because when you have ES here, typically you work with, um, for example, let's just say that you work at a school or at an institute or something. Typically, they insure you. They give you, a, aside from your pay, they take away a small fraction and that goes into your insurance. And every place that you work at, at least publicly, has to do this. There are exceptions where you can use your receipts uh, and you don't have to pay for the insurance, but you don't get insurance either. So I didn't have insurance and that was a problem only because the doctor said, well, you could schedule to get rehabilitation here, but that could take forever. <laughs> Like literally for rehabilitation, like I guess you could say like I need it now and they might give it to me like a week later. But if you have insurance, they, you know, I guess they push you off into like a separate category where you get attended a little bit faster. So there is a definite benefit and I'm, I don't remember if there was a question here about benefits or if it's just something that I remember someone had asked before, but there is a definite benefit to having insurance. Since you pay for something, you obviously get better attendance um, or quicker at least and the second question in regards to what do I think about taking a taxi or an ambulance I guess it kind of depends on your your urgency your emergency because for example I had a foot injury that wasn't killing me the first time so I don't remember the sirens blazing like to take me to the hospital um, but if you're dying, like literal level red with that I talked about earlier, then I'm pretty sure that you'll get the more, you know, quick treatment in an ambulance. And with vehicles, ambulances, police cars, of course, firefighters, fire trucks, those do get the siren, which pushes aside people because people literally, sometimes they don't, but most of the time, like I guess you could say 90% of the time they do, respect that there's an emergency vehicle coming by and you know they park to the sides and let the vehicle pass some people are pretty sneaky with it and if it's an ambulance they'll follow the ambulance in order to you know get by faster but for the most part it's it is more convenient in that sense to have the ambulance because it pushes aside traffic in some situations you might be able to argue that a taxi would be faster just because taxi drivers are insanely fast drivers in general. I wouldn't say there's a, a clear benefit to one or the other. I guess with an ambulance, the advantage that I would see with it is in a big city where there's a ton of traffic, like cars out the booty. And you go in an ambulance because the ambulance is going to push aside the cars. Not literally, but you know, it's going to make them, okay, there's an ambulance coming. I'm going to park to the side. In that sense, I would go for an ambulance. But in, in a smaller city, you might be able to argue that a taxi might be faster just because they take all the quicker routes. I don't think a, an ambulance wouldn't, but I would be more inclined to believe a taxi would over an ambulance just because it's a bigger vehicle. And maybe the driver is just used to emergency driving going through the main roads while a taxi driver goes through the more sneaky quick roads to get you there quick. So that's my take on it. It's not definite. It's not like A, a said we should definitely take a taxi or an ambulance. It's just what I was able to see because this is my experience with that I've had. At least I had a good ambulance experience but I didn't have a life-ending you know emergency. So 
Uh, another question that I saw, very good one too. Uh, why can't people be turned away from specialty hospitals and sent to basic clinics for basic problems? Or require a referral system where a basic doctor approves a visit to the specialist? Well, I mean, if I look at it from, I guess you could say, a human aspect, and I don't know if I want to say human because I think some people who put themselves in this position are pretty inhuman or inhumane. I think it's inhumane. But one of the doctors that I mentioned in the previous um, podcast episode, he talked about how people get kind of upset when you don't do things the way that they want you to do them. Like, if you, if you have to attend a patient, like, let's just assume you're at a hospital. And I don't know if this happens worldwide. This is just the experience here. But you have to attend a patient. And the patient thinks he's dying. Like, their situation is the worst emergency in the world. But you diagnose it and you're like, this isn't a big deal. You can go to a, you know, more basic hospital. Some patients get kind of aggressive with that. Like, I guess it depends on how you tell them. But I don't think you should have to, like, completely like talk to them like they like baby them to tell them that you know your emergency isn't a big deal you shouldn't be here but people take that the wrong way because like people get kind of aggressive there and then they start to post things they didn't want to attend me over here they're bad like that that's the problem with how you attend people here like you can like i mean i'm pretty sure people are smart enough to know that if the hospital is you know a specialty hospital that's what it's called a specialty hospital if your problem isn't a specialty problem you shouldn't be going to that hospital but there are people who think that their needs come before others i'm not just saying that's here by the way i think this is a worldwide phenomenon where people just don't realize that other people are in a worse position than they are and decide that that their problems are the worst problems in the world. That's why when earlier I was talking about, you know, I can't gauge the level of, you know, emergency that everyone around me had. Like, I'm very understanding about the problems that people have because I can't say my problem is worse than this person's problem or that person's problem because I don't know if that is actually the case. So it's hard to say. Some people are more aggressive than others. Some people don't care. But... There's all kinds. The referral system, as useful as I feel it would be, like, you know, sending people to the right place, it's also kind of hard to implement because some people don't take that the right way. They think their problem is gonna be bigger, so they wanna be attended quickly and sent to, you know, the correct attention as quickly as possible. But anyways, let's look at another, let's see, I think it was a question. No, it was more of a statement that I thought was pretty good. So here, a person said, in the U.S., you have to wait more than 12 hours to be checked, not even by a doctor. Um, I had got back from Cuenca, Ecuador. My husband had a tumor when I was in the U.S. They said it was from wearing glasses, but thanks to the doctors in Ecuador, knew it was a tumor. We did the surgery, and he was in and out so fast. So I think what you experienced there was more of an exception and not the rule, because like I said, I mean, I wasn't, you know, in a life or death situation, but being attended quickly is not always going to happen, especially when it's like, in this case, it's hard to say if like what the condition was in because you don't go into detail. At least this comment doesn't go into detail telling me, oh, maybe they were, you know, uh, dying. Uh, they went into the hospital in a, you know, in a wheelchair or like being wheeled in from an ambulance. Um, it doesn't give me that much context. So I don't know if you went in like in an extreme situation, but if you just go in walking and you tell them, oh yeah, I've had this kind of like situation, uh, I don't know, maybe uh, a pain here, like they might give you the same thing that I got, like treatment level green or even level blue because it doesn't look severe. Like you gotta come in being wheeled in, like what missing a leg, have an arm lopped off or something and you're gonna get quicker attendance in those situations. Like you gotta look the part. But if you just, you know, go in, then it's very much hit or miss. 
So hard to say here, um, but I did want to analyze a little bit of that. Like, depending on how severe you look, when you go in to get attended, is going to determine probably how quickly you get attended. They will check you out, of course, because you can't just go in and be like, oh, I'm dying, and like, oh, well, we believe you, and then they'll attend you quickly. They're going to check you out first. But for the most part, you know, the more you look like you're in, in danger, the more likely you're going to get attended quickly. So those were some of the more, you know, standout comments, questions that I saw. And, you know, I, I wanted to kind of give a comparison because, like, there's a lot of things that I feel aren't always the best about healthcare here. I, my friend Don, my good brother Don, Don Shader, actually talked a little bit about how he saw the poor conditions in Solka Hospital. I saw very good conditions in uh, the hospital, Hospital de Especialidades, but that's a relatively new hospital. The Verdi Ceballos, I've heard, I think it's been a little bit renovated, but it's generally not a, the nicest looking hospital either. I think it's been renovated though, so at least there's that. And there's just different hospitals that have, you know, different situations. You can't categorize everything in the same, you know, in the same category. There are some places that are clearly better than others. But there are situations where I just feel like things aren't done correctly. Like I said earlier with the supplies, like what does it cost the hospitals to get the strips? In some hospitals, I've heard situations where you gotta go buy your own medicine when that shouldn't be the case. Here, it's not, you know, hospital level, but it's still a medical treatment. I had my teeth, wisdom teeth and such, removed, but I don't get put to sleep for it. And I don't know, because this was just when I was in the States, I actually had like four teeth removed when I was in the States, but over here, like they don't put you to sleep. In the States, they put me to sleep for that. Like, Literally, I was knocked out and the next thing I knew, I had my teeth removed and I was in a bed. So it was just like, it's like two different worlds when it comes to like the level of treatment. But that does go into what I wanted to mention about, you know, healthcare in general. Like, I don't think any system is perfect. And because I don't want to give out that idea that maybe people are thinking, oh, so you think the States is perfect? Well, here comes my angry comment saying, no, it's not perfect. No, it's not perfect. Just from the fact that you have to pretty much sell an arm and a leg, like they, like they say here, in order to get healthcare services, it's just pretty crazy. But like my doctor friend said, having it free is not the solution either. Because once it's free, people take advantage of the system to get attended for things that they don't need to get attended for, which holds up the queue, the line, for people who do need to get attended quickly. So we have to understand, I think it doesn't matter which, what country you go to. Maybe there are some countries with amazing healthcare systems, but Ecuador is not that. Ecuador has benefits, very good things about their healthcare. The fact, and Don Shader's talked about this, there's doctors who will attend you through the phone. Like literally here, if you have a problem, you can just, hey, you know, I have this situation. Doctor would say, oh, I'll go to your house. It'll cost you like $20, $30 and I'll go get that checked out. I don't think that exists in the States, unless that doctor is your friend, and I don't think they're charging you $20 or $30. So there is that super benefit. But in the actual system, going to get yourself checked, going to get yourself attended, going to, you know, going through the process, which might not be the greatest, because who knows? Like with me, four hours of wait time, or in the time when I left, an hour almost to, to get dismissed. Um, with Don seeing the situation in, in the hospital, the Solka hospital, seeing how it was just kind of like ugly, the bathroom's not good. Like that goes into what he said also about them being more pampered, more spoiled in the States because they have nicer facilities. I, I will definitely say that anything that I remember seeing when I was in the States, and we're talking about 10 years ago, like I have not seen over here. Like maybe the specialty hospital was the closest thing, but I definitely feel like they had much better facilities. And over here, people having to have their tooth yanked out while not being put to sleep, while over there in the States, like you get put to sleep for that. And some people might just say, you know, just for that. But for some people, that's a big deal. 
So, you know, it's two different worlds. You take your wins and your losses as you can get them. Like, you get cheaper cost of living over here. You get wonderful people who super kind for the most part. And the healthcare system isn't null. It's just not perfect. And it doesn't have to be if you're just looking to, you know, live a good life. Of course, if you want the best experience in healthcare, you go to the places that offer it. But that's not here. They have amazing, excellent healthcare systems. And I'm sure there's probably one hospital here in Ecuador, even if it's private, but there's probably one hospital or clinic that's just the most amazing experience you'll ever see. Because I do know of people who talk about if you want to get eye treatment, you have to go to Guayaquil. If you want to get a special surgery, you have to go to Quito because they're specialty like doctors, specialists. Those are the places you go to for those surgeries, those situations. But that's not the whole Ecuador picture. If you're in a city like, let's just say where I'm at, Puerto Viejo, you take what you can get. And if you want more, you travel to the cities that offer more, of course. So yeah, that's, that's the whole, that's my whole second episode of healthcare argument, discussion, whatever you would like to call it, because I'm not trying to fight about this. That's why I say if you want to, you know, angrily tell me that the States is worse um, or better or Ecuador is the best, you know, that you're entitled to your opinion because we all experience different things. And as I've mentioned before, it's definitely better to get different opinions and see exactly what the full picture is for you to make a more educated and informed choice when you decide to live in Ecuador or retire to Ecuador or just travel because you might get injured while you're over here and you need to go to a hospital. Do you get the treatment here or do you have them fly you back to the States so you can get better treatment over there? Quote unquote better treatment because it might just be the same thing, it just looks nicer. It's another argument we can have here that maybe it just looks nicer in the States and it's just the same thing as over here. But there's no way for me to guarantee that unless I go get attended at the States right now and get attended over here. I can just give you my personal experience from what I've seen, what I've recently experienced, what I had it from experience in the States. And honestly, I just like it much more over there. What can I say? It was a very spoiling experience. But yeah, so that is... Uh, what I wanted to talk about this episode. I really hope that it gives you a ton of value because at the end of the day, even if you don't agree with everything that I say, it'll give you a better perspective of what to expect when you're coming over here. If you don't, well, maybe not agree with it, but maybe you just don't like it. Because I realize that listening to what other people have to say and um, other people's experiences might give you a more, you know, rosy colored eye glasses when you come over here. but. You know, it's better to have every experience and see it and hear it so that way you're prepared for it. So yeah, I will hopefully be having another episode talking about healthcare, but next time with someone to accompany me so that way I can ask hopefully a doctor about what their experiences have been because before anyone here is a doctor, they are a patient. That's just the way life goes. At some point in your life, you do get checked out in a hospital so maybe we can ask them some questions if not the closest thing is going to youtube and asking well checking out my friend don shader's channel because he did interview live a doctor on his channel so you should definitely check that out but for the most part here i just hope that this information was useful in some way shape or form and i'm hoping for a guest in the future who can give you even more value so i hope you have an excellent rest of your day, of course. Take care, and as always, ace out.